Welcome back to the Reading and Writing Podcast. I'm joined on the podcast today by Julia Bryan Thomas, author of the novel The Radcliffe Ladies Reading Club. Author Mary Anna Evans wrote about the novel, a loving, engaging tribute to female friendship and the intimate power of books. Julia, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much. I'm thrilled to be here. Absolutely. Well, if someone hasn't yet heard about your new novel, The Radcliffe Ladies Reading Club, how would you describe the novel? Well, I love to be the... Um, front je- dust jacket cover copy that my publisher wrote, they said it's a love letter to books. And I love books so, so much. I brought together a bookshop, college students, and then I had them delve in through a character who owns the bookshop um, into classic novels that I personally love. To So it's a, it's a book for book lovers. That's wonderful. And I'm curious, do you remember the original idea or impetus that led you to writing this novel? Um, I had just uh, published my last novel, For Those Who Were Lost, in 2022, and I, it was published in 2022, and I had, that was my first historical novel, and I knew I wanted to write another historical novel, but I didn't want to write one set in World War II again. So when I was thinking about it, I I really knew that I had always wanted to write a novel about young college women at an Ivy League college in the 1950s. I'm I'm fascinated with that time period, and I love old movies and um, and books set in that era. So I decided uh, that that would be my starting place. Well, your book is about the power of books and reading and friendships. Have you been a lifelong reader yourself? I have. Oh, my goodness. Um, My grandmother, uh, I lived with my grandparents when I was very young, and my grandmother introduced me to all kinds of books, everything. It was just such an eclectic um, literary education that I received. Uh, I remember a book, some Chinese fairy tales and Charles Dickens when I was very young. I was reading Daily Copperfield. and But I also um, was a big reader at school and in my school library all all of the time. So I worked my way through the usuals, Anne of Green Gables and the Railway Children and those sorts of books. So from the earliest age, I was happiest if I was reading. That's great. Have you been a member of a book club yourself? I have. I started a book club. I'm, uh, I taught for 25 years, first grade most of those years. And I started a book club with some fellow teachers to get to know teachers in a building where I was new. And so we had up to about 11 of us, but it was mostly a core group of about eight. And we met together for about 10 years and we got to know each other so much better and really discovered the power of books and the meaning that it can have in our lives. That's great. I'm curious, are you still friends with any of those people? Oh, yes. Although a (laughs) lot of people have dispersed through the years, you know, moved to different states and things like that. And we don't have our current book club. I'm actually thinking about starting a new one. That's great. Well, can you tell us about your writing journey that led you to writing and getting your first novel published? Oh, well, I happen to be married to a mystery novelist. His name is Will Thomas. He just published his 14th um, Barker and Llewellyn novel, which is a crime duo set in Victorian London. And my husband and I decided, oh, around the year 2000, we'd raise our children. They were up in high school, and we wanted to do to start going after some of our own dreams. So we decided to write. And we sat down, and we each set, wrote a manuscript. And I remember when he handed me his manuscript, he said, can you do me a favor and type this? Well, it wasn't just a handwritten manuscript. It was written on post-it notes and steno pad paper, and it was just a giant mess. And of course, I had typed my own, but I, I started in and I was very grumbly about the whole process, and I started typing, and I was kind of 
you know, pressing very hard on the computer keys. And I've got about <laughs> 10, <laughs> I got about 10 pages in. Oh, and I went, oh my gosh, this is a book. It is beautiful. So we we got his typed and mine was typed and we sent them out to agents. And I did all of that process too. I researched how to find an agent and and all of those things. I actually went into their backgrounds and decided who I thought was the most qualified, the most wonderful agent. So I, I made a list of 20 and I sent um, our books out, um, his, sent his out first to five and three uh, wanted an exclusive read on the book. So that ended up being the beginning of his series and what has ended up being 14 books. But during that process, I was sending mine out and I was getting the most lovely but horrible uh, rejection slips. Rejection slips that said things like, this is really great, but let me see your next one. Or I could have published this 10 years ago, but not in the current market. And don't give up, but this isn't it. And so we, so that was a little discouraging, but we sat down and he was going to write his second book and I was going to write a new manuscript. So we did. And that process went on through five long books. All five of his were published and all five of mine were rejected. Oh my and gosh. I know. So I, I've sad. done I've done hundreds and hundreds <laughs> of interviews, and this uh -huh. is the first story like this that I've ever heard. And I guess my next question is, how in the world did you live with that? <laughs> I know. I exactly right too, because um, I had to think. Uh, one thing that I I I dealt with it is I thought, what is the best thing for him? I want the best thing for him, and how can I be supportive of him reaching his dreams? And should I just give up? But something turned me around. We were driving to a writer's conference where Will was on the panel with uh, several other well-known writers. And one of the writers was Dennis Lehane, which I'm sure you know from Gone Baby Gone and Mystic sure. River yeah, and those things. And so we had the opportunity to talk to Mr. Lehane um, for quite a while that day. And I just asked him a few questions. And he said something that gave me the courage to keep on going because I had all but decided to quit, that I was an excellent editor. I had edited all of my husband's books. <laughs> and, and you know, usually they would change fewer than 10 words, you know, from, you know, beginning to end of the process. So I knew I could edit. But Dennis said that at home in his bottom drawer in his bedroom, he had the five worst novels ever written. And I said, no, you don't. You know, I've got the five worst novels ever written. <laughs> and he said, I realized, he said, I'll never throw them away. I love those books. And the reason that um, I'm so attached to them is that was my education in writing. In one, I learned how to write dialogue. And one, I learned how to write uh, uh, characterization and plots and everything. And I realized as I went back home and I went through my novels, that was exactly what I had done. One was very dialogue heavy. One was focused on a plot. One was focused on characterization. And so I realized that I was in the school of teaching yourself how to write. I, it was my own education. And I thought, I said to my husband, you know, this gives me hope. I think I'm only one or two more failed books away from making it. <laughs> so, um, and was so that the, the case? That was the case. The very next book I wrote was uh, The English Boys, which was published in 2016. And it was a uh, Library Journal debut of the month novel. So, it, you know, it, it got a lot of attention. I was so excited. And the next year I wrote Penn Hill Wood. And they were both contemporary British mysteries and got excellent reviews, starred reviews from Kirkus and Library Journal, and they were wonderful. But then I sort of thought, you're reinventing the wheel with every book. It was It's kind of interesting when you're married to another writer, and he has, um, you know, two characters and a lot of um, extra characters in his book, and they are all on a journey and they're growing every time. But when you're writing a standalone novel, you're creating a new world with every book. So I thought, what world do I really want to find myself in? And 
So uh, a couple of things brought me to the next step of my journey. And one was, what do I love to read the most right now? So I pulled out my five favorite books and I realized they were all historical fiction. And that's what gave me the desire to maybe go in that direction. That's a, that's a great story. Well, and what and what was your what was your first the, historical? You mentioned the two contemporary mysteries. What was your first right. historical? It's called For Those Who Are Lost, and it there's an interesting story about that as well. I had decided that I was an education major because I was a teacher, obviously, and all of my other members of my family, my husband and children, were English majors. So I always felt a little at a disadvantage because I had gotten a degree to be practical and didn't follow my heart into English like I wanted to. And I thought I would love to continue to study and grow. So I applied in 2018 or early 2019, maybe, uh, to the Yale Writers Workshop. And I was accepted. So I had the opportunity to go to Yale, live on the campus, and study with some excellent writing coaches. And that really gave me a lot more information about who I am and what my strengths were and what my weaknesses were and what I needed to work on to try to improve my craft. And I'm just so thrilled that I had the opportunity to do it. And while we were there, my writing coach said, all right, um, we're wrapping up the course, but what I want you all to do is to go home and write a 1,000-word short story every month and submit it to one another, and then you all get to vote on who wrote the best story. And I am competitive. I am tenacious. I wanted to win every <laughs> single month. <laughs> and so <laughs> uh, I sound like a nice person, but boy, I'm competitive. So I um, I got in there, and I thought, well, this is a great opportunity to try different things. I wrote a fairy tale. I wrote nonfiction. I wrote new style stories. And then I hit upon a story uh, based on some research. I had been just reading about World War II uh, just because I'm interested in that era. And I was reading uh, The Splendid and the Vile by Eric Larson and mm -hmm. a few other things. And I came across the fact that on the island of Guernsey, uh, 5,000 children were evacuated in a single day, just days before I'm, 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 the I'm, 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 Nazis invaded and occupied the island for five years. So I just couldn't imagine it. And not only did they evacuate these children, they brought fishing boats, uh, tugboats, any kind of boat that they could get from the southern coast of England over to Guernsey. And they evacuated the children from the schools with teachers. And it appealed to me because I was a teacher, and I couldn't imagine, what if I left my family and had to go and, you know, live in a foreign country with my students? It was just such an interesting concept to me. So I wrote the short story about it. I did win um, in my small group practice writing group that month, and I thought that was the end of it. But when the pandemic hit, and in March of 2020. I was sent home. Schools were closed for the last quarter. And I thought, I don't want to think about the pandemic. I, I really need a positive focus. And I, I decided to just go ahead and expand that short story into a novel. And the interesting thing uh, is just a, a few weeks ago, the Library of Congress um, noted, sent me a letter telling me that they've selected for those who are lost to be featured at the National Book Festival in Washington, D.C. in August this oh, wow. year. So, so I'm That's super amazing. thrilled. A lot of people have loved that book, and I loved it too. And it, it just really showed me that historical writing is the place where I belong. Sure. So can you tell us what was your writing process when you were working on the Radcliffe Ladies Reading Club? You had talked about having this idea um, are you someone who sits down and, and plots the entire novel, or do you just have kind of the kernel of the idea and dive into the narrative? How does that work for you? I always start with the kernel of an idea and dive into a narrative. On 
uh, for those who are lost, I thought I was starting it. I thought I was going to write a sweet little book about a teacher who evacuates with her students. It didn't turn out that way at all. From the very first page, it was about this really complex character who steals a child in the middle of the chaos. So right. it, it kind of went its own direction. So I started, I see how I get a feel for it, and then I start what I call a chapter outline, and I jot down my ideas in in order, and it expands and grows as I become more familiar with what I'm doing. About halfway through the novel, I'll write the end because I want to know what I'm I'm working toward, this? basically. And Interesting. I'm, yeah, I'm. I, I usually uh, write. I write on my laptop, but I usually sit down and write until I've gotten a page number or something that. I want to get to, to stay on track. So what writing advice would you offer for those who are working on their own stories or novels? You know, it's really easy to give up and it's really easy to think about, you know, thinking about how you want to be published or you want to get an idea out into the world. But the real true advice for me, what it really came down to after I went to Yale was, I shouldn't write unless I love what I'm writing. If I would write it only for me and not for anyone else, if I would just, when I sat down with For Those Who Are Lost during the pandemic, I wrote that for myself to give myself a, a an outlet for creativity and calm in the middle of all of the chaos that was happening around us. And the same was true with the Red Cliff Ladies Reading Club. I wrote that for me because I was just so in love with the time period and the characters and the journeys that they were on. So it's, you have to love your writing. It's about more than when I was younger and writing books that weren't working, I wasn't in love with those books and they weren't successful. And when you learn and grow as a writer, educate yourself as a writer, find out where your holes are, how can you get better? And I do want to say that this is a, a serious piece of advice for me. Don't show your writing to anybody unless they are e extremely knowledgeable about books. I don't give my book out widely. I always read novels from famous people, and they say, thank you to these 27 people who read my book. <laughs> and I shake my head because I just can't imagine that. My husband and I don't even show each other what we're working on until we're convinced this is a full-blown book. And, <laughs> you know, I, and it's about loving it yourself and not letting other people weigh in too much. And I'll give you a couple of examples about that. Sure. When, I was, when I was writing Radcliffe, and we do something called, what we call the read-through, which is we actually read it aloud to the other. We don't let the other one read it. We read it aloud. Because that also helps you catch some of your mistakes that you make, or if you're repeating words or whatever. But I was, I read him aloud the first chapter of Radcliffe, and he said, Oh my goodness, well, you know, I don't know who will like this book. And I said, I like this book. I love this book. And my agent loved it, and my publisher loved it. So it worked out. But the same is true. He had an idea for a novel that's going to be published next year. And I'd been telling him for four or five years, oh, don't write about that. Do not write about that. I don't think that'll work. And yet when he handed me his finished manuscript, it was brilliant. And so I, I think you have to trust your own heart and your own instincts about writing. And if you let people weigh in too much, they can kind of move you in the wrong direction, maybe. Very true. Well, I wanted to ask you, I mean, as we've talked about, your your new novel, The Radcliffe Ladies Reading Club, is about um, reading and literature and books and the power of books. Um, I'm curious, uh, what are your thoughts about kind of the current um, book bans that are going well, on or attempting oh, to go yes, on I have a lot in, of thoughts in about some states and cities in the U.S.? Right. <laughs> and that's happening in my own um in my own state, I quit teaching last year, and in our school district, books are coming off the shelves. They can't have classroom libraries, 
because they, you know, they don't know what parent they're going to offend. I really believe that, and I, uh, that if as a parent you will read some banned books with your children and discuss them with them, you're going to have a more wonderful experience as you both talk about what you both like, dislike, what you feel about material, rather than banning it. I think that, uh, you know, in some cases, they're trying to ban books in actual libraries, and which is, it's just the, a terrible situation. It makes me think of Fahrenheit 451, and we're sure. all going to be memorizing, you know, Jane Eyre and so forth. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that... Uh, it's just a heartbreaking time to go through it, but I do think that I'm hoping that like a rubber band that this time is going to snap back and people will come to their senses and realize you may control your life or perhaps your children's life, but you can't control your everyone in your state's life. Absolutely. So, um, so and it's I think a, these a, things are cyclical. As you said, I think it'll, it'll <laughs> recede, hopefully. Um, or in the, the words of Stephen King, if they ban a book, you should run out and buy it and read it immediately. <laughs> I know, exactly. Did you hear Amanda Gorman's poem that she read at oh, the I Biden know. inauguration has been banned uh, in some schools, I think, in Florida right now. And, right. And we have family and friends in Florida, all of whom are, are talking about whether or not they should leave the state. I think some of these extremist Physicians are causing people to feel not at home in their own homes and cities and states. So it's a it's a true problem. But I don't think it's the majority of people who feel this way. Sure, so I agree. At least that's I, my hope. So I've, I'm curious, have you started working on a new novel yet? I have. Um, I'm under contract for my third historical novel. It's it. Well, I've had two come out in two years in a row, 2022 and 2023, and the next one will come out in 2025. So I gave myself a little bit of a breathing room to stop and think and try to come up with what I want. It's set in 1960 in Paris, and it's a little bit of a um, a thriller, a little spy novel. So, <laughs> I, <laughs> so a little bit of history. I love history. I love France. So I'm reinventing the wheel a lot with this one, but I'm having a lot of fun with it. That's great. Well, what novels have you read recently that you enjoyed? Oh my goodness, there are so many amazing books out there, and you know, I went, I was invited to speak to a book club about a month ago, and everyone sitting there was saying, "Oh, I've read ten books in the past ten days," and I don't <laughs> tend to do that. I like to savor books. And I think maybe it's because also I'm writing and I've got to have my own focus on my own work. So I tend to go through things a little slower than I used to before I was on a writing schedule. But recently I loved Lessons in Chemistry by Bonnie Garman. Um, I've been reading the, um, I'm reading right now The Tales from the Cafe by uh, Toshikazu Kawaguchi. And he's written a trilogy. I'm on the second one about a cafe, time travel cafe in Japan. That's wonderful. And, of course, every now and then I like to go back and reread a favorite. And one of my favorites is A Gentleman in Moscow by Amor Tolls. So that's, I think it's a brilliant book. It's just inspiring to read good literature. And I always say, I don't, I never like to say that I get writer's block because all I have to do is pick up a book and read excellent writing, and it makes me want to go get my laptop out and get going. That's wonderful. Well, where can people find you online if they want to learn more about you and your novels? I'm on Instagram, and I have a Facebook page, Julia Bryan Thomas Author. Um, both That's the name for both the Instagram account and the Facebook page. I'm also on Twitter um, at, uh, at author Julia T. And comment on all kinds of things, but mostly book things. So That's wonderful. Well, again, we've been speaking to Julia Bryan Thomas, author of the new novel, The Radcliffe Ladies Reading Club. The novel is available now, so go buy a copy. And Julia, thanks for doing this interview. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure. It was a pleasure.